Ladies and gentlemen, today we are celebrating the centennial of the passing of the 19th Amendment, the women's right to vote. 1920 was eerily similar to 2020. The Spanish flu pandemic killed millions. Racial unrest across the country and a bitterly contested presidential election. Our story features three women who were pivotal in pushing the 19th Amendment across the finish line. The place, the Tennessee legislature. The time, August 18, 1920. And now, I'm proud to introduce the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, Miss Carrie Chapman Catt. I'm so glad to see so many of you ladies here today. I am Carrie Chapman Catt. Welcome women of the East, West, North, and now today, the South. Thank you all for bringing the NAWSA, the National American of Women's Suffrage Association, to this point. Tennessee will decide the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The question, will women finally get the sacred right to vote and become full citizens? And will we have independence? We women have trudged and slogged through snow and mud, through many great cities and states. We have worked hard to ratify 35 states of the 36 needed. Sadly, we have lost 11. Tennessee is an all or nothing win. I am proud of my home state of Wisconsin for ratifying the 19th Amendment just this past June. When I was in college in Iowa, women studied, hoping to practice their profession as doctors, lawyers, teachers. Many are doing so today because they made their own way. We women have worked hard as men in factories, building machinery, tanks, and munitions for the war effort. This was dangerous work, but every open occupation was filled by a woman. NAWSA pledged two million women to President Woodrow Wilson as carpenters, metal workers, and miners. We women fed America running farms. We kept the trucks running as mechanics and drivers. We women built them, engines and all, as auto workers. And we did the same for the railroad. While our men were off fighting the good fight, we were soldiers here at home feeding them, clothing them, making the rifles our men held in battle. In 1913, we marched. And in 1916, we marched again. In New York, we came so close, losing by only two votes. We were just two votes shy. But today, we proudly wear the yellow rose of suffrage and we will get the Tennessee legislature to wear one too. We have spent the last week lobbying each and every legislator. When I personally tried to vote in 1864 with Sojourner Truth, we were turned away. And many that tried were fined. And when women tried to wear pants, they were fined too. So we joined forces with the abolitionists and Frederick Douglass for civil rights. 
and our causes are joined as well with those of the United Christian Temperance Movement, whose passage of the 18th Amendment for prohibition has given great momentum to our cause. We women have run an effective lobby organization. We went in the front door with no funny business. Everything was on the up and up, unlike others who went in the back rooms using bribes for their causes. In the West, particularly Wyoming, was the first to let women vote in 1864. All women except Indian women, and we are fighting hard now for their rights. We are pleased and proud of House Representative Jeanette Rankin. She's a pacifist, and she is the first woman voted into Congress. In our future, we will have one from every state. When I pledged two million women to work for the war effort, it was a compromise I had to make. It cost me my membership in the National Peace Party, of which I had founded. Progress always comes with great sacrifice. I know that women voters will make this right and end all wars. We women have picketed, marched with banners, and held meetings across this great country. We have met with every single congressman, senator, and state legislator. We kept careful notes and, on everyone and pursued them passionately for their support. We wrote letters and asked every woman who has a husband or a son in this Tennessee legislature to write them a letter requesting their heartfelt support. We women have suffered insults, abuse, mockery, and intimidation. But we stand here today strong with all of our cards laid out on the table. We have given it our all. I have spent 40 long years fighting for this cause, asking great sacrifice of you women. I asked for three hours a day and weeks at a time for travel. I know this has been a heavy burden on your family, being away from your husband and your children, but this sacrifice will offer us opportunities for the future. We have seen great suffering. Our brave soldiers are coming home and brought with them a flu, a scourge, that many of you who have worked as nurses have had to watch them suffer. We have seen an increase in the scourge of polio and rheumatic fever as well. Today, we stand with all of our citizens of all colors, helping them in this time where heated race riots have embroiled us all in a heated discord. We need peace, not violence. Oh, I see now across the street, the legislature seems to be completing their vote. Hello? We won by two votes? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I could hear the legislative chamber erupting in celebration. We have won by two votes. Two legislators have changed their vote. The deciding vote was cast by young Harry Burns, who got a letter from his mother asking him to support me. So ladies, now that we have the right to vote, we must use it for good. We need to work together to fix the ills that face our great nation. Every woman needs to vote and run for office. 
Now, it is my honor and great privilege to introduce to you a sister suffragette who has worked hard to help make this day possible. I give you Ida B. Wells. also like to thank you for the work you did during the pandemic. I know that the Spanish flu tore through our Chicago area. I am Ida B. Wells. I am a resident of Chicago, but I was born a slave in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862 during the Civil War. While my parents were also slaves, they taught me to read and to write. My father was what you would call a loyal man loyal to the Union. After the war, our colored community flourished under Reconstruction until Jim Crow. I studied liberal arts at Russ College where my father worked. Later, I attended Fifth College during the summer where mosquitoes caused a yellow fever epidemic to run rampant through our town. The fever, it took both my mother and my father, leaving me as guardians to my two younger sisters. I tried to support us by teaching and writing short articles for a Memphis newspaper, but my articles on lynching and other Southern horrors were too controversial. I bought into half of the Memphis newspaper and began writing articles on anti-segregation. I included my own story. On May 4th, 1884, a train conductor with the Chesapeake and Ohio Railroad ordered me to evacuate my seat in the first class ladies car and move to the rear of the train to a car with no available seats. I had been enjoying the Civil Rights Act of 1875 where President Grant had signed into law a public accommodation clause allowing blacks to go into restaurants, trains and hotels without denial. So I hired a lawyer and sued. I won $500. The train countersued, however, and appealed to the Tennessee Supreme Court, which overturned the case. When I published a pamphlet on the case, an angry white mob broke into my newspaper office and destroyed the printing press. I resolutely replaced the press and continued printing. My emphasis was on documenting the lynching of black men. I have investigated 400, but I know there are so many more. For my safety, my sisters and I then moved to Chicago to live with a relative. At that time, many black Southern families looking for work migrated to Chicago and Detroit. It was a mass Northern migration of more than one million people. It was there that I met and married a wonderful man, man named Ferdinand. He was a newspaper art editor and a widower with two boys. We ended up having four more children, two more boys and two girls. I joined the suffrage movement speaking, writing, and organizing for civil rights for which I faced much anger. In 1913, I was invited by Alice Paul of the National American Women's Suffrage Association to come to Washington, D.C. to participate in the National Women's Parade. I and other members of the Negro Suffragist chartered a bus for Washington. Alice Paul owned my 100-page book, The Red Record, which detailed lynchings since the Civil War. I autographed it for her. The book along with my association with Frederick Douglass, was my ticket to the parade. 
Alice organized the women to march by their occupations, and she promised me a place with journalists of all races. But as we were practicing the parade formation, Alice's assistant, Lucy Burns, said that we colored women would have to follow behind the rest of the parade because Southern white women refused to march with or behind us. But while marching in the rear with my colleague, Mary Church Terrell, we saw men along the sides interrupting the parade's progress. During that chaos, we colored women took the opportunity to infiltrate back into our respective occupations, myself rejoining the journalist at the front of the parade. The New York Times reported it was a very beautiful parade and it was estimated that more than 100,000 spectators were there. Our Negro suffragists fought to be included in the National 19th Amendment. We joined Alice Paul's newly formed National Women's Association, or the NWA, and had a meeting with President Wilson on January 9th, 1917. The president disliked Alice Paul, and our colored presence irritated him even more so. Although he was supportive of women's rights at a state level, he said he was unable to support the 19th Amendment because it was not part of the Democratic platform. Well, that next day, January 10th, we stood with Alice Paul and other suffragists and took up posts as silent sentinels in front of the White House. Taking shifts, we stayed at our post until January of 1919, two entire years. When suffragists were periodically arrested, the colored women were always reluctantly released because there was no place for coloreds to be held. They couldn't put us in the same jail as white women, but the guards verbally abused us with their frustration and their hatred. During 1918, the Russian Revolution commenced and Americans were being solicited by communist organizers, in particular, the Negroes. Toward the end of the year, our black heroes, our black veteran soldiers returned from the war to end all wars. More than 380,000 proud men. On their return home from Europe, they brought back an experience of equality. In Europe, they were treated with respect as liberators. They were invited into European homes where there was no Jim Crow equivalent. Many soldiers stayed in Europe with their new families, but those returning to the U.S. were not going to be treated as second-class citizens once they got home. This was met, however, with white resistance. Riots broke out across the country, race riots. They called it the Red Summer. Many people were killed, and 90 or more colored men were lynched. I documented their lynchings, and as a journalist, I investigated them. I was once again prepared to go to Washington, D.C. to march for the 19th Amendment. Days before I was to leave with my sister suffragist, we attended a send-off and listened to a classical operatic concert performed by a young Marian Anderson and Roland Hayes with an all-black symphony orchestra. Marion was the first African-American to record black spirituals. We had no promise that colored women would be included in the 19th Amendment, but we went to support the cause anyway out of principle. Civil rights and women's rights have always been wrapped up together. Frederick Douglass urged and supported Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, and her daughter, Mary Stanton Blanche, in their common struggles for abolition, equality, and peace. To this end, I am a proud founding member of the NAACP. I have always been an advocate for child labor laws and a supporter of social reformer Jane Addams. 
I am a church woman supporting colored churches, and I will continue to help through our Negro women's clubs to encourage and protect black men voting at the polls. And I promise to do my very best to help the cause of ratification of the 19th Amendment for all women as originally written. And now I'd like to introduce you to my dear, dear friend, Alice Paul. Alice, get up here. Thank you, ladies. It is an honor to be in the presence of such strong women. My name is Alice Paul. I am unmarried and I plan to stay that way. I have a mission and intend to complete it. I'm not willing to have an anti-suffragette win the day. So for me, men are out. I'm an advocate for women's rights and I plan to win that sacred right to vote. I believe we are equal to any man and that's how I was brought up as a Quaker, believing that all people are equal, black, or white, red, or brown, or yellow. All are the same in God's eyes. I can see no inherent superiority in either sex, except I believe women are smarter, but that's my personal bias. I am a biologist by training, and I hold a master's degree in economics and a PhD in social work. I grew up in Pennsylvania working with my family on our farm that I still love. I was encouraged by my mother and father to dance, to draw, to paint, and to read. They told me I could do anything for which I had a passion. And in my community, there were female teachers, poets, lawyers, and nurses. Education was important. But the reality is there is little to no opportunity for them to work. But women are by nature resourceful. And like Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, the first American female doctor, she and her sister started their own women and children's hospital. Men were squeamish on treating women, which gave the ladies their opportunity. Single women owning property like their male counterparts even as far back as the revolution in 1776, were allowed to vote at certain times and in certain states. But once married, women were stripped of their humanity, relegated to the status of property. And many states have not changed their position on women or Negro rights. Our sisters in the temperance movement have shown that drinking is the main cause of family disintegration. It leads to poverty, domestic violence, and alcoholic dementia for the male. Mental institutions have been unable to cope with the sheer numbers of men entering with this disease promoted by a culture of alcohol use and giving the incentive of a free lunch and happy hour to entice men into a stupor and exhausting their weekly wages. When I sailed abroad to England, I was the first woman to study economics in that country. I wanted to see the world, and while I was exploring, I listened to a speaker named Christabel Pankhurst of the Women's Social Political Union. I saw her speaking in the streets, holding her own against men trying to drown her out. I was moved by her words, and I knew I needed to be a part of this movement. I had never before seen women shout, picket, fight, and be carried off screaming by police. I followed their lead. I marched protested, chained my self-defenses, and I was drug off to jail with other suffragists. We threw things out the jail windows, and the newspaper in my home state 
reported on the Pankhurst Army, and I learned that I was referenced as one of her soldiers. When I sailed back to the States, I was interviewed and told the reporters I was here to bring the fight home. I joined Carrie Cat and the NAWSA, and I was given the task to organize the 1913 Women's Parade, the largest parade ever planned in Washington, D.C. I purposely planned it to take place the day before President Woodrow Wilson's inauguration. I knew President Wilson was the person on whom I needed to focus, and I did so from the start. The parade was comprised of thousands of women from all over the country. We had floats depicting women's contributions throughout history. We had women marching down one side of Pennsylvania Avenue, state by state, and down the other side by profession. We had engineers, doctors, lawyers, journalists, librarians, nurses, artists, oh, with Columbia the female personification of the United States, portrayed by Inez Mulholland, and she was leading us on horseback. Floats with banners stated, votes for women. We all dressed in white in solidarity, each draped with a purple, white, and gold striped sash. There were many bands playing, and we marched and we sang. Toward the end of the parade, we were attacked by men tearing at our banners, blocking the parade route, causing injury to Columbia. The newspaper sided with us, stating how beautiful the parade was and condemning the bad behavior of the men. For the next year, I was on good terms with Carrie Cat, but by 1915, when I started to write and publish The Suffragist, magazine and became more militant, oh, I was expelled from the organization deemed unladylike. I then continued what I learned in England from the Pankhurst tactics. I stood on my soapbox with others, spoke our views, and argued with men who heckled me. I started the NWA, the National Women's Association, with my good friend and colleague Lucy Burns. With financing from several wealthy Harrises, we picketed in front of the White House, the first time that had ever been done. At first, they tried to ignore us. But after a while, they arrested us on charges of obstructing traffic. President Wilson could not promise federal support for our cause, only his personal support. So. We stood out in the cold, taking shifts, six days a week. We took turns warming ourselves on hot bricks, and we carried banners, but kept silent. The president would tip his hat to us each morning as we held our banners high. As the war in Europe waged on, the Sedition Act was enacted. Anyone who spoke against the war effort could be charged with sedition, so our banner stated, protect and defend democracy. Wilson's own words. Police arrested us and took us to a jail known as the Occoquan Workhouse, where they beat us, tortured us, and fed us worm-infested pork. We demanded to be treated as political prisoners. These were women who had never been arrested and at first, we served our sentences for several days. But a second arrest got us 30 days. And when we went back to the White House again for a third arrest, we received a sentence of seven months. But we continued. And others took our place as we took turns filling the jail, the newspapers following our every move. As a drastic tactic, I went on a hunger strike, joined by many other women. After four days of our strike, our jailers began to force feed us by putting a tube up our noses and into our stomachs and 
and then feeding us a combination of eggs and milk. I endured this torture 55 times. But while in jail previously, I had an idea. The Pan American World's Fair was being held in San Francisco. We sent representatives to collect signatures on a petition for an amendment to the Constitution for women's right to vote. We collected over a million signatures. We brought them back by car from San Francisco all the way to Washington, D.C., across deserts, by dirt, and mountain roads, traveling from city to city with the press following our progress. Our strategy was to be in the paper every single day. Now that we're in jail once again, fighting via our hunger strike, the press is putting pressure on the government as we begin to waste away. <laughs> no one wants a dead suffragette. And we were very nearly there. <laughs> they released us. Within a year of our White House vigil, President Wilson, who was the key, capitulated. And on January 10th, 1918, he finally endorsed the women's right to vote and passed it along to the Democratic Party to endorse. But he endorsed it for states' rights only. We stood outside the White House with a banner addressed to the Russian envoy stating, we do not have a democracy if half the population does not have the right to vote. So we stayed on as silent sentinels until President Wilson finally endorsed the federal 19th Amendment. It would take 36 states out of the 48 states for the amendment to pass. We won the states in the West, Idaho, Washington, Oregon, California, but it was a real setback to lose Ohio. And we only lost Ohio due to the fear that men would lose their beer. The Brewer's slogan was to install a fear that you would lose your beer if you vote for women's rights. I was in jail when the 19th Amendment was finally passed in Congress. But we had sent representatives to Tennessee for the final push across the finish line. And once we had won, I began working on the Equal Rights Amendment, the ERA, in 1923. By then, I was studying the law and received a law degree. Later in 1928, I received a PhD in law and fought for civil rights. But I had always hoped that Ida B. Wells would forgive me for my single-minded quest for women's votes, ignoring the racial aspect. I considered Ida my friend, and I was proud when she marched with me in 1913. She died in 1931. I promised her I would work for civil rights, and in 1947, I indeed worked for the Equal Public Accommodation. My once mentor, Carrie Chapman Catt, passed away in 1947. We had our differences, but I believe together we were able to achieve our goal. I fought on for civil rights. I marched in 1964 with Martin Luther King and John Lewis for the Civil Rights and Voting Act, and we won! but there's still so much more work to be done. So I call on all ladies clubs to continue the ongoing fight for the Equal Rights Amendment. Vote for women senators and representatives and mayors and governors and write them to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed and make Congress remove this time limit that has stalled of passing. What are you waiting for? Get it done! Get with it! Get it done! Thank you.